When Mary Seacole returned to London from the Crimean War in 1856, she was bankrupt. Although I was not ashamed of poverty, beginning life again in the autumn, I mean late in the summer of life, is hard uphill work. In her rented rooms in Covent Garden, she could comfort herself with the four government medals she'd received for her kindness to British soldiers. And the British soldiers were not about to forget her. A roster of Crimean veterans organized a spectacular fundraising gala for Mary Seacole in July 1857 at London's Royal Surrey Gardens. The orchestra was immense, formed by the bands of the regiments of the Guards, the Royal Engineers, the Royal Artillery and the 11th Hussars. Over four consecutive nights, 80,000 people turned up and bought tickets to celebrate their Crimean hero. The gardens and the splendid music hall were crowded every evening, and Mrs. Seacole, as soon as she was recognized, was greeted with loud cheers and every demonstration of enthusiasm. At the end of both the first and second parts of the entertainment, the name of Mrs. Seacole was shouted by a thousand voices. She was a real celebrity. It's extraordinary that this black woman, whom nobody one had heard of before, nobody outside the military, should arrive in London and be celebrated and carried around on soldiers' shoulders. Um, it was just completely unprecedented. Never one to miss a commercial opportunity, she used the occasion to launch her memoirs. Mary's autobiography, The Wonderful Adventures of Mrs. Seacole, I mean, the title itself tells you how extravagant the book it is. It's a masterful exercise in self-publicity. She was fully in charge of her image the whole time, but she managed to marry that with, I think, a deeply felt conviction that she wanted to be useful to people. The services of Mrs. Seacole in the Crimea. Mary Seacole's fame was no flash in the pan. Being deserving of recognition and reward from the Army, Navy and British nation. A decade later, her supporters in the upper echelons of British society joined together to provide her with a pension. And the Queen having been graciously pleased to express her approbation of Mrs. Seacole's services. Queen Victoria donated 50 pounds towards her welfare in old age. Alexandra, Princess of Wales, employed her as a masseuse. And the Queen's nephew, Count Glycan, sculpted her. Mary Seacole was finally accepted in the bosom of the British Empire. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, his Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. His but Royal not everyone welcomed Seacole's recognition. His A recently discovered letter written by Florence Nightingale reveals her indignation at Seacole's celebrity. She felt Queen Victoria had been duped. A shameful or ignorant imposture was practiced on the Queen, who subscribed to the Seacole testimonial. The fundamental problem for Florence Nightingale was that Mary didn't operate just as a nurse under Florence's thumb at Scutari. The problem was that Mary was a woman of business. She made money, and the biggest problem of all was that she sold alcohol. Nightingale's antagonism went further. Most damningly, when Mary Seacole once again volunteered her services to the nation, Florence Nightingale intervened with a poisonous job reference, insinuating that she was little more than a brothel keeper. She kept, I will not call it a bad house, but something not very unlike it, in the Crimean War. Anyone who employs Mrs. Seacole will introduce much kindness, also much drunkenness and improper conduct, wherever she is. 
Yet even Nightingale's slanderous disapproval couldn't dent Seacole's reputation. Punch magazine summarized her unique contribution. Be the right man in the right place who can. The right woman was Dame Seacole. Mary Seacole died in her sleep in London on the 14th of May, 1881. She was 76. Reader, now that we have come to the end of this chapter, please look back and see how hard the right woman had to struggle to convey herself to the right place. For a while, the Seacole legend was sustained by the veterans who knew and loved her. When they died, there was no one left to carry her flame. It was the sort of celebrity that burns very brightly while you're alive. Um, but I think when you die, it goes out. As Mary Seacole was forgotten, so too were the herbal and holistic medicines from the Caribbean that had helped so many in the Crimea. They were ignored by the medical orthodoxy of the time. This was not part of the British healing tradition. And the British healing tradition was much more formal, much more focused on doing things in a medical way, as it was seen then, and obviously in keeping a distance between the patient, the other, and the healer. If Mary Seacole was the wrong kind of doctor for late 19th century Britain, the greater obstacle to her recognition was the prejudice that she had the wrong colour skin. There's no doubt that attitude towards uh, blacks, uh, racial attitudes, hardened significantly. We know this to be the case. We know the after effects of the Indian mutiny. We know the after effects of the Moran Bay Rebellion in Jamaica. And we know that all these things helped to harden racial attitudes within this country. For most of the 20th century, Britain saw no need for black heroes. Mary Seacole, however, made a comeback in 1984 when her autobiography was republished. Ever since, interest in her life has gained momentum as people have once again discovered her remarkable story. Mary Seacole was a phenomenal woman, an independent, free-spirited woman. Mary Seacole's success in the Crimea uh, indeed, her success in Panama had to do with her experiences, her training, her background, her preparation in Jamaica. If you take Mary Seacole's experiences in the Crimea away from her Jamaican background, then you miss what made her Mary Seacole, what made her such a woman. Mary Seacole is now studied by every school child in Britain as part of the national curriculum. And in a nationwide poll in 2004, she was voted greatest black Briton of all time. In the same year, a long-lost portrait of her was rediscovered by Helen Rappaport. It now hangs in the National Portrait Gallery, facing Florence Nightingale. It's an image of the mature Mary after the war, very proud, very dignified, and it's iconic because she wears the red scarf of the Jamaican, of the Creole, which is her signifier. She's a proud Jamaican, but she also wears her medals. And she's a proud British subject. And it's an amalgam of the two sides of Mary, her Britishness and her Jamaicanness. It's a wonderful image of an extraordinary woman with her chin tilted up, saying, here I am, I am a Crimean heroine. In the bicentenary of her birth, the unique self-made woman, who was neither black nor white, who was both a fiercely proud Jamaican and an ardent British patriot, has reclaimed her place at the heart of history. <laughs>